paranormal. It surrounds us. It's everywhere. Tonight, you will hear from the people who live and work within these highly active locations. All in the efforts to discover America's most haunted, most haunted, most haunted. with your host, ghost hunter and author, Dan Terry. Good evening, boys and ghouls, and all you dearly deceased who just haven't departed yet, but we're glad you can make it. I am Dan Terry. I am your ghost host with the most haunted. We did have a little wrench thrown into the works tonight. My guest, Harley Black, uh, we can't make contact with her. I I truly hope she's okay. I hope there wasn't an accident or or sickness or anything. But show must go on. You know, a few months ago, I was down in Missouri, and I was at the uh, St. Louis Paranormal Research Society's offices. They also run ghost tours of the Lent brewery, the Lent mansion, the Lent neighborhood. And in fact, uh, Dr. Mark Farley, who's the founder of it, has been on the show before. Well, he's got a Ouija board collection that has turned into kind of a museum. And the reason I say that, people were sending him Ouija boards that had ghosts attached, that they were afraid of. Um, Some of them were really, really old. It's And he's got stories for so many of them. Well, I set up my camera in the Ouija Museum, I'm going to call it, which is right there in the office. You can go and see it. And as we discussed it, well, the stories were amazing. Uh, I know he's been to the hospital once over one of those spirits. Uh, One lady felt something in an incredibly expensive, like a $700 Ouija board from the 1920s. And broke it over her knee because she was scared. It's quite a bunch of stories. So we're going to run the video I shot in the Ouija Board Museum in St. Louis with Dr. Mark Farley. So you check this out. Get on there uh, on the comments and let me know what you think. Do you want to use Ouija Boards? Would you have Ouija Boards that other people send you? You enjoy this. It's going to be an awesome clip. Good evening, all you guys and gals, ghosts and ghouls, spooks and specters, and all you creepy crawly creatures of the night. If you're looking for the most haunted, well, son of a gun, so am I. I'm Dan Terry, your ghost host with the most haunted. This weekend, I managed to get out of North Carolina and went down to Missouri, and I was a guest of the St. Louis Paranormal Research Society. They were doing a ghost hunt in a 100 plus year old factory and it was pretty incredible. This factory has been making the same product for over a hundred years. Kind of a neat place, very haunted. I'm working on getting that evidence together for you later, but for right now, while I was there, I took a tour of the St. Louis Paranormal Research Society and more, more importantly, Dr. Mark Farley's Ouija board collection. Now this is set up like a museum now. He um, has become such a renowned, for lack of a better word, expert in Ouija boards that people send him boards that they believe are haunted, possessed, demonically possessed, cursed, whatever word you want to use. They're afraid of them. He gets sometimes two a week sent to him sometimes with nothing at all, just a package with a Ouija board in it. Other times there's phone calls or a a letter explaining why they're sending it to him. And we're going to hear some of those stories from him out of his office at the Lemp Brewery in St. Louis. So check this out. Uh, 
Oh, I guess the board that started it all for me is this board right here. And this is the mama board. And a lot of people say, how can you pick the mama board out from all the other boards? And they, they, they see me feel it. Like, oh, you can psychic connection. connection. I said, no. It fell off the table one time. There's a dent right here on the side. <laughs> You're ruining the magic here, man. But no, this is the first board I ever got. And I bought it from the Peebly Flea Market back in 91. And me and my friend's wife, we started getting interested in Ouija boards. And every Saturday night, I get off work, I go to my friend's house, and all our other friends would come there, and we would do a Ouija board session. So, in the spirit that I, we got connected with this board is Mama. And we connected with her quite a bit. And we still do connect with her. And so I, I brought this board, we're using the board, and Mama has, she's not a friendly spirit, she's a malevolent spirit. And she has these things, she calls them children. And from what we understand, what I've come to understand over the years, is these children are kind of something she feeds off of us, other spirits she feeds off of on the other side. Well, one night, we were doing the session, and we asked Mama where she was at, and she spelt out kitchen. Okay. So my friend Harvey gets up, he goes to the kitchen to get some of the drink, and they have those vinyl dual pane windows, and when they leave, they get moisture in between. Well, in between the moisture of the two panes was written the word mama. There's no way he could have done it. There's no way anybody could have done that. And that's the first time she escaped from the board. Back then, I didn't know how to get her back in. But over the years, I've probably spoken to her over the last 20, 30 years, about a thousand times on this board. So she's... Do you think it's a human spirit then? No, I don't. I don't. She is, she's over the years become very aggressive, very taunting. Mm -hmm. um, she keeps one. The thing is, when you invite, like, it's like, can you show me a sign? You're really inviting the spirit out of the board. Like, can you knock on the wall? Oh, yeah, I can do that. Words of that. <laughs> right, you yeah. know. So you gotta be very careful. She's she's devious. Hmm. And um she a couple of times she has escaped. I do what they call the last rites ritual and over here on the on the wall we have what we call the emergency box. And it's a sick call kit from a from a Catholic priest in the church. Okay. And in the Catholic religion a Lay person, normal person can do the last rites ritual. So, when necessary, I'll break it out and use it. And I have a couple of different ones here in the case too. And that's what you use to put spirits back yeah. in when they we do get away. We, yeah, we do what we call last rites. We set it up. And do it. Okay. okay. We have three boards that we keep behind glass, and the reason why they're behind glass is they're extremely dangerous boards. Now, the thing is, I can do, I can burn the board and release, when you burn a board, you release what's attached to it, release it out into our realm. I, I can throw the board away, but then it becomes someone else's problem, mm -hmm. and it can hurt somebody else. So what we do is we put them behind glass so they can never be used or touched. This one here is the Sphinx board. It was made by the Canard Company and Conrad Company, sorry, Conrad Company in the 1930s. And when I got that board, it was still wrapped in its original wrapper, tissue wrapper. So I get this board. And what year was it? Made? This one was made in 1930. And I was the first person to ever do that board. So I get it. I actually bought it from eBay, mm -hmm. that board. So it's a Friday night after tours. I sit in here. I use the board. And the, the spirit wasn't a friendly spirit, but... It one thing it did when I was using the when I was moving, when I was using it, it my hands hands stung like you were, when they fall asleep with needles but more intense. And so I left it here on the table when I went home, closed it out, went home. The next morning, I'm up here at Elder's Antiques, and her daughter Elder Sherry Elder's daughter Shannon says. You've got a problem. 
I said, what do you mean? She said, half your face is not moving. So, and so I went and talked to my sister, who was a doctor, and I said, Nora. And she says, yeah, you need to go to the hospital now. So I go to the hospital, and my blood pressure was so high that they couldn't even do a blood pressure check. And they were saying, how do you walk in here? Are you got blurry vision? Do you have a headache? None of that. And the thing was, a week earlier, I had a, I had a checkup. Mm -hmm. No signs of hypertension, no signs of stroke. I was in perfect health until after I used that board. So Saturday night, I had tours, and I had a seance scheduled that night. Well, we canceled tours, but I called my friend Sierra, who's a very gifted psychic. I said, can you do the seance for me? I forgot that I left the board on the table. Sierra th that said, she thought, this is the board she wants us to use. So he wants us to use. So they used that board that night. Well, I'm, next morning I call her up. I said, hey, how's the seance going? She went fine. She said, that Sphinx board. I said, oh, shit, you, didn't, you know. You didn't use that Sphinx board, did you? She said, yeah. And apparently there's a female spirit attached to it that absolutely hates men. Luckily, they had an all-female crowd in here that night. And they talked about, because at the time, they didn't, she knew I was in the hospital. She didn't know what, really what it was for. And I didn't know what it was for until the next day. But, or, but yeah, she hurt me. And ever since then, I put her in the glass case. Now, I was talking to a, a news crew that were in here, and they were doing an interview, and I was talking about the Sphinx board, and while we were talking about it, it fell. It was actually mounted up against the back. It fell and hit the glass, and I haven't had the balls to take it off the wall. And put you think that's it. an attempt at it to yeah. have you take it out? Something so, like you believe you were the first one to ever use that. I was the first one. So, did it come off the line with a spirit attached to it? You know, you hear weird things about the Conrad Company, um, about these boards. They were supposed to do some sort of weird rituals over them when they came off the line and stuff like that. But it definitely had whatever I got a hold of it that night. And I, to this day, I still fight with high hypertension, mm -hmm. and I never have regained taste in my mouth. Wow. From that, yeah. And... I think I think I had a minor stroke. They didn't determine that, mm -hmm. but whatever it was, it got <laughs> the second board we had behind glass is the Mihai board. And the reason why I call it the Mihai board is that's how the spirit identified itself. Let's jet back just a bit. How do you get these boards? Okay, a lot of these boards I've been have been sent to me. And they they don't know they got this cursed item so let's just send it to Doctor Farley. <laughs> Thank you. But I've got boards from all around the country. This one here is actually from England. Somebody sent that to me from England. Is that the one that got lost? That's the one there. The lady. Okay, she sent it to me, and she sent me the tracking number for it. And I sent her money. She. I said it was it was a lot of money to send it here. I said yeah. I'll, it was like twenty dollars. I I yeah. I'll send you. I'll. Give me the how much it costs, and I'll send you the money. So she sends, so she sends it to me, sends me the tracking number, and I, and I'm watching it, and it went from London to New York, New York to the Chicago's Customs House, and there it sat for three months. Okay, so I file a lost package. So the local postmaster calls me, and I give her all the information. She says, "Well, I'll see if I can't track it down." So then I get the director of the Chicago's Customs House. She calls me and wants to know what's that pa what's, what that package is. And basically what they did is they ran it through x-ray machines. And it's not going to show up as anything in an x-ray machine. It's car I mean, cardboard and cardboard is, is mm -hmm. going to show up as cardboard. And they kept it quarantined in a different cage that no one went into. And I told them it was a Ouija board. And she goes, that explains it. And she hangs up. I swear to God, the next day that was on my phone. <laughs> <laughs> and there is a Sphinx board, another one, right? That's another one. Yeah, that one's damaged. I was um, going to ask how that got the corner. I found that off. in the. I, I don't know. I found that at an antique mall. And this is from what year? About this is um This is nineteen. Um, 
1932. Okay, so this one. Okay, so Mihai. So I'm using this board. Now this is a 72. And you can tell a 72. Let's see if I got one easy I could pull up. Okay, here's a 72 right here. 72 is different from any of the other boards. Okay? So this is 67 to 71. And you can tell that because they're wood. Okay? Mm -hmm. And they say Parker Brothers Incorporated Salem Mass on the bottom. Which all Ouija boards say. But in 72, they changed up for a year. And they just say Parker Brothers. Okay. But guess what? cardboard and the decal looks slightly darker and the rose this is supposed to imitate rosewood and it's slightly more the grain is slightly more pronounced in the 72 so and I have generally had bad luck with 72 so this is the Mihai board and one night I was I got the board they sent it to me they said something's evil with it Mark will you take it I didn't have a choice, it was already on my front porch. So I started sitting here, I was using it. And the spirit that was attached to it called itself Mihai, which is Latin for me. Who are you? Me. It wouldn't give me a name, which is usually a sign that you're dealing with something more up on. Well, I'm using the board, I'm trying to force its name. And again, my hands, it was like an intense like an old like electric shock and I took my hands off the board for a second I put it back down and then the board's dead nothing's going on and then Loki out here goes ape shit and they, so I go I close the board out go home and I'm working here the next night by myself and just you know Something's here. Something's not right in the office. And you would hear like footsteps. Loki would kind of be he would he would come hide in the corner and stuff like that. So I had to do the last rites ritual and open the board back up, do a last rites ritual and pull it back into the board. Once I did that, I closed it back out, waited for a little bit, nothing happened, and then I just put it behind the glass. So So explain to folks what happened that caused that? I don't know which. It, it was like an electric shock. Mm -hmm. And as soon as I pulled my hand, see, when you use a board and you're, you're, you're on the planchet, you are a physical barrier to keep things from coming through. If you just take, if you don't close the board out, and how you close the board out is move the planchet to goodbye, say goodbye, and take it off the board. If you don't close the board out, it's like leaving the phone off the hook. Okay? Older reference for older people. <laughs> but, um, but if you leave the phone, if you leave it open and, and nobody's there, some, if it's strong enough, it can punch through. And that was a strong enough spirit to punch. It was strong enough to make me jerk, and make, mm -hmm. make me pull my... Because I did it. And then I realized. You knew what you'd done to me. I knew what I wanted done as soon as it happened. And, um, yeah. So, you are, when you use the plant, you are the physical, but you are the barrier. Mm -hmm. So... If it's true, so keep your always keep a hand on the so. And then one above it, one above it was another spirit. Never got its name. And this one, we're using it, talking to it, and it baited me, and I fell for it. You know, and I I gave it the invitation. It was looking through unwittingly, and again, it comes out, and. You can now Loki wasn't here that night. It was just me, and the board is kind of like, huh? I'm talking to a different spirit now. Okay, I go through the board and you know get down my session, close it out, throw it up on the wall, and then again over time, I start noticing things aren't right in the office, and you know there's there's a shadow figure here in the office, and. I had to do another last rites ritual to pull it back into the board. <laughs> and the cross is to help keep them in there? Yeah, I would be. I did that as for effect. Um, I didn't do one on that one because Amazon raised the price of these crosses to $20. <laughs> I wasn't going to pay the $20. But it's up high. No one can mess with it. So, You once told me a story about a very old board that a lady swore had a, 
an evil spirit in it. Oh, you're talking about the uh, the blackboard, the, the ones you broke over him. I had what they call by the fold cor- corporation. These are fold boards. Let's see. Uh, these are. This is the fold here. Yeah, well, okay. okay. And um, you know, William Fold Baltimore. Um, this is before this one here. It's probably I gotta look. This is probably thirties. The other one's forties. This is actually a very rare board in front of it here. This is a Park Brothers. Okay, so when when William Fold made the boards, he made the normal version, which was this size. Then he made a deluxe version, which is this size. And you can tell the difference in the sizes of the board. And if you want to see a comparison of what they're like today, no, go ahead. Okay. So this is this deluxe. This was this is the standard size. Now today, this is about two thousands, and then this this is a twenty twenty. <laughs> My God, <laughs> shows you how much they've um, decreased in size. But but I forgot where we're going with this. One. <laughs> But this is the um, this and the reason for this is the original original way folds told you to use them is two people sit with their knees together and you can lay the board between your knees and use it that way. But um, okay, so you were going to talk about the old one that got broken. Oh, the old one that got broken. Okay, so this is as I said before, this is supposed to simulate rosewood, and but fold made what they called the blackboard. And the colors was the colors were inversed, so the board was black, and the letters were rosewood or yellow. And I had it sitting up here. They're a very rare board; they didn't make that many of them. And I bought it again at a flea market for like ten bucks. I think I read people just didn't like them. Yeah. And then, lady came in here. She said, "This board is evil," and broke it across her knee. And it was a fifteen hundred dollar break. That board was worth fifteen hundred bucks. Mm. And to this day, I'll, you're, I'll never get another one. And then one was stolen from you. I had an original Elijah eighteen nineties board, and that's why I don't let people back here unescorted. I don't know how they got it out of here—a big plank of wood—but they did. And what is an Elijah board? They were the one first one. Elijah Bond. He was the inventor of the Ouija board. He's the one that actually got the patent. And when he died, he left the patent to William Fold, who came up with, he started his own novelty company and started, um, Mark, he's the one that actually was smart enough to copyright. Because the patent's only good for 17 years, the copyright at that time was good for like 25, so as the patent ran out, he copyrighted it. So he got another 25 years. And now I think the copyright's 75 years after the person's death. Thanks to this. I came across when I started when I was doing a lot of research, I came across this I don't know way to even describe it as metaphysical fantasy in a way. Um, I didn't want to sensationalize this lecture because this is already a subject that is pretty much sensationalized itself. I wanted to kind of give you a, a, a history through the Ouija board and then talk about the stigma of what of in society that a Ouija board has and talk about how I think a Ouija board works. So, as I was going through my research, uh, common names, I will, I will always refer to it as a Ouija board, but other boards are a talking board, mystic board. Mystic board and Ouija board were made by the same company. They were, it was Fold's way of trying to corner the market. Witch board, spirit board, Egyptian luck board, believe it or not, that's how Elijah Bond, when he got the first patent for the Ouija board, that's kind of how he patented it, as a, um, a, a, a divine the Egyptian board is another term for it. But I'll, on this, on the, during this lecture, I'll always call it a Ouija board, just to not confuse everybody. What's funny is, this is where it got marked as a toy or a game. That's how he got his patent for it, because he has to prove it. The patent was going to... If he's going to get a patent for something that was his claim that was realistic, he'd have to prove that it worked. And so if he marked it as a game, he got around that. But that's kind of been the plague of the Ouija board from the inception. 
people always talk about it being a game, you can buy the Toys R Us. I was, I, my claim to fame is not paranormal investigation, it's urban exploration. I mean, compared to most paranormal investigators, my views on trespassing are very liberal. So I was in an old farmhouse down in southern Missouri, and I saw, it was, the house was, it was gutted. But there was a shelving unit built into the wall, and one of the shelves had looked like erasure, like chalk and erasure marks, where people wrote on with chalk and wiped it down. And it didn't dawn on me at that time that was the first use of spirit boards. They would use shelf boards because they're nice and flat and big, and they would use a glass and go across the board. Well, I thought about it as I got home. I like, oh man, that was a spirit board. So I went back about, about two weeks later to get it. The board was gone. The house was torn down. So I made my own, and this is the reason why it's round. Is because at the, when I was making this, a flat board at Home Depot was thirty dollars. This was ten dollars, so <laughs> it was cheaper. But what I did was I, I, I stained it black, wrote on it with chalk, and the reason why I used um, ebony stain is it makes it's easier to read chalk. And you can, and this is great because you can do anything you want with this board. Always put a goodbye. Always put a goodbye. But you can put different names and stuff on here. They can move to different names. If you're talking to a specific spirit, you can kind of customize this at will. Just simply wipe it down and then write goodbye. And then always write goodbye. <laughs> I can't say that enough. But then you can, whatever you need it for, you can kind of customize it for your needs. So this was the first talking boards, the way? The way they would talk, first talking boards were simply a plank of lumber with a little chalk. And Great people awesome. today does not have to spend fifty dollars for a itty bitty tiny no they don't Ouija I mean, board seriously I mean how in the hell this is thirty bucks now you know ten dollars I had stain at home so I stained it and then dollars tree piece of chalk. I do recommend, though, if you do get it, you do make your own, sand it smooth. Take the time, take a piece of sandpaper, sand it really smooth. Just makes things glide a lot easier across it. And then get something on there. I use a planchet like this. I'm going to make a different one. But it's got glass beads on the bottom of it. The good thing about it is it slides a lot easier. <laughs> Is that a handmade planchet? Goodbye. Uh, no, this came with another board. Um, it's, it looks like it's a posi resin, and they glued glass beads at the bottom of it, and it and it flows really nice across here. I want to make a different one. I particularly don't like this one. The planchet that I normally use for my Ouija sessions is somebody made this for me. It's just a simple epoxy cast. I put felt pads on the bottom of it. So it glides on these boards, it glides easier. And people say, why don't you use the ones that come with the board? Comfort. So I don't use two hands, I just use one hand mm -hmm. to use it. And um, to me it works, it works good. And you get them and then the felt pads, you can get them at Dollar Tree or Walmart. Look up, you know, get a big old pack here. You want to spend three bucks? That's a lot of weed. So it's a lot of, it's really easy to make your own Yeah, board. make your own. Um, <clears throat> but with this, I you, what you can do is you can find something you can use as a planchet. And then I would, on this type of board, I would use something hard plastic. Or these are just simple glass beads that people put in flower pots and stuff that have a flat end. Just glue it on those super glue and it works for them. Yeah, Egyptian luck board. You can see this in the original Ouija board pad too, Elijah Um... um that's him holding as a patent certificate up there. We have, if you want to know what one looks like up close, we have one hanging on the wall with a paper clip. Now he's the one that's responsible for the modern artwork of the Ouija board. That we all know and love. This board here is was was a 1940 deluxe model, and the deluxe one was bigger. If you want to get an idea of what they're like today? 
this is what you spend thirty dollars on today. So you got a little bit more money's worth in the forties. Now originally they were made out of wood, and the wood they were made out of was what you call rosewood. But he was really um, successful in marketing. He was really successful in marketing. He started the Fold Novelty Company when he got the rights. Other people come in here, they always ask about the board that they want. And this board here is a carnival board, Carnivella. And it's actually got a serial number. It's got a serial number on here someplace for it. But my friend Warren, he was a honest to God, legit satanic priest. He was also probably one of the best paranormal investigators I've ever worked with. And in Satanism, the most important holiday on their calendar is your birthday. So it was my birthday. He got me a Ouija board for my birthday. And unfortunately, I've never been able to get it to work. <laughs> Zozo, the Ouija board demon. I've never come across Zozo. Um, he's kind of a phenomenon like the Slender Man, I guess. And I don't, I don't know, I've never tried to summon him directly. <laughs> but they both claim that they've come across them and the Greeks have it. But the thing is, and this is what I don't understand, if you are Satan or you are a real demon, a fallen angel, that's infinitely old and infinitely more knowledgeable. Why do you need Parker Brothers? <laughs> you know? Um, anybody Catholic here? I'm not calling you out. Okay. So, demonic possession. You want to talk about that? Basically, demonic possession is when your soul leaves the state of grace. Okay? That's why it's so important for you to be baptized. That's why it's so important for you to go to church. That's why it's so important for you to recognize Christ and accept Christ regardless whether you go to church or not. Because your soul will stay in the state of grace. When your soul is not in the state of grace, that's where you're susceptible to be possessed. Right? Yeah. Okay. So, that's what the um, exorcism of Emily Rose. She was definitely a God-fearing woman or a young girl. And that's how I don't think, I don't understand how she became possessed. This, people think this, mistake this for the blackboard. This is a Canadian version of the Ouija board. And you can see it has responses in English and in French. English and French. And the funny thing, too, a lot of people don't know this, Ouija is French for yes, German for yes. So. Now, the other board we talked about, this is a special, specially board here, and this one is Cosmo, Cosmo Brian. And autographed. it's autographed. Yeah, he autographed it. Now, Cosmo Brian boards aren't nearly as nice. They're, really, they're cheaper than this. But this board here I bought, and if you want to talk to your loved ones, because we, we hold weenie board sessions in here for the public a couple times a month. So I want to talk to my mom. This is the board that I break out. The only problem with this board is missing one thing. Goodbye. So how do you close it out then? Say goodbye and just take the planchet off. Move the planchet off the board. So this is one people you, you use because it brings in family. Yeah. And yet it's got a demon, a skull, a yeah. spirit. It's got an eerie. It's got an eerie photograph on it. It's got a little demon flying here. It's got a demon reading some book. Some, you know, but yeah, but this one here, if you want to talk to family members, and one. what about Cosmo? Cosmo, he builds specialty boards. When was that? Is that relatively new? Or uh, that... this one, I would say, this was 2000, maybe 2012. When I got this one, let's see here. Yeah, he's got number here zero 2068. It doesn't matter. But nowadays... Has so he got some kind of designs going along the edge of it? Yeah, he did. He spent a lot of time on the early, his earlier boards. He spent a lot of time on them. Huh. But now, you get them and they're rather cheap.
Okay, the ha Haskell board, Mystic board. This board, as I said, used to Urbex. I was Urbex in this old house, beautiful, well, one time it was a beautiful house in North St. Louis. And I'm up on the second floor, and I hear this thing in the closet. It's like a... Okay. So in Urbex, you're more worried about people than you are a ghost. So I went in the closet, looked in the closet with my flashlight. I saw this laying on the floor. I figured it wanted to come home with me, and I took it home with me. So this is before, this is actually before I really got big into the paranormal. So, 1940. Now, this is the mortality, mortality rates for England, but they weren't much different from the United States. And believe it or not, 50%, in some places, up to 50% of five-year-olds, children die before they reach the age of five. Average age of death for a poor person would be 29 years old. Middle class would be 45. Upper class would be 55. And mortality was so high in the Victorian era that the spiritualist movement really gained momentum. And it became a major part of the Victorian culture. And because people were dying at such a rate. It wasn't uncommon for things like a cholera outbreak that would kill thousands of people. In 1849 here in St. Louis, cholera destroyed up to anywhere from 20, um, killed it up to about 20% of the population. And at the time, they didn't understand how, what caused cholera. They called it the Egyptian deviation, but I can't, I will mispronounce this word, deviation. Devi Am I saying it right? Deviation? Yeah. Divination. <laughs> and and what happened was they copied it during the in, um, late Victorian period. They tried to convert it to English. And basically what the um, Egyptian board was, was hieroglyphs on a table, and you would take your finger, and you would just randomly where spirit took, told you to take it, and you would stop at certain hieroglyphs. And that would be, that would be your mouth to tell you that the carnage during the American Civil War was just outrageous. This was the first modern war. This was a war of attrition. And Grant's strategy for defeating the, defeating the South was what they called the meat grinder campaign. North had more population. North had more able-bodied men than the South. And we're just going to grind them down. And if you look at some of the um, casualty totals between the North and the South during battles, the North lost a lot more men, but the North won. And Two to three hundred thousand requests, the War Department, about casualties. Um, a lot of times they died, they buried them in the battlefield, you never knew where your, your loved ones were buried. And you can kind of see how this gave spark to the spirit, spiritualist movement in the United States. Mainly, I was just trying to find out if your loved ones were still alive. Anymore. I remember my grandmother talking about watching, basically, I mean, a lot of you probably heard this, watching the TV during the Vietnam War to see if they could see their um, children or their son on TV every night. And a lot of times, too, you know, accuracy. The casualty list, even though they tried to be accurate, weren't accurate. And what if you had two John Smiths? So, but a lot of people turned to spiritualism to try to decipher this. And basically, the American spiritualist spiritualist movement was born here in America because of fear, confusion, and worry. Instead of not knowing where the family loved ones were at. But the problem with spiritualism is psychics cost money. And at the time, being a psychic was a not as much as the United States, but in England it was a way for a lady to kind of advance herself in society. In 1967, sold it to the Parker Brothers. Parker Brothers bought the rights. Of course, now it's made in Salem, Massachusetts to give it that more authentic <laughs> feel. Um, what you start seeing too in the 40s, the same cost. There were, um, like this one here, they started then uh, turning on thin lumber instead of a board. Now, this one is the difference between the 40s and the 50s board is 40s board has the backing, the faux backing, rosewood backing, where a any board after that. Because during the Second World War, it came into a lot of manufacturing problems. 
lots of supply problems. So that was a, and during the Korean War also. Anybody can use it. You don't need special psychic gifts to be able to use it. And you were talking about that during one year, but when the obelisk came out, psychics were already uh, downing it because basically you had a machine that could replace them. But yeah, anybody can use it, and even kids can use it. I um, had one, I can't find it, but that was Mark and Bill, young girls. Barbie has a Ouija board. Yeah. So, a lot of people come in here and they look at this and wonder what this is. This is a Victorian viewing basket. And I have a friend up the street. Her name's Sherry Elder. She owns Elder's Antiques on Cherokee Antique Row here. And it's Sunday. Sunday morning, 6 o'clock. I just came from the Alton YWCA. I had an event that ran at 3 o'clock in the morning. I'm in bed. I got another event starting at 11 here. Uh, a gallery. So... She calls me up at 6 o'clock in the morning, and she says, Mark, you know those coffins I got? I said, yeah. So I'll make you a really good deal on them. Now, she was selling both coffins, like this one was 1000 and the other coffin she sold me, which is up in storage right now, she wanted like 750 bucks for it. And I knew this, you know, I, well, I said, she said, I'll make you a really good deal. I said, what do you call a really good deal? She says, $250, get them out of here today. Well, I had to go to the ATM, and all the money that I was going to draw out of the ATM, because I didn't go to the bank the night before, was going to be used for the event. I said, I'm not going to be able to pay you Monday, or, you know, she said, I don't care, get them out of here today, you know. So, as soon as she opened up, she had them stacked by the door for me. And did she ever say why? Okay. So, she started seeing a ghost of a child running through her shop when she brought these in. So, freaked her out, freaked her daughters out, freaked her customers out. So she said, get it out of here. So, but when I brought it in, this one in here, then I was cut one couple days afterwards in the metaphysical shop in the cases. We have glass, ca glass cases with glass doors. I saw its reflection run from case to case to case right into here. And I had to move this because during COVID we shut down. And I moved it and I almost dropped it. And it's a wicker basket. And underneath the pillow, I found, I'm going to mispronounce this, but the Cheerio type photograph was underneath it. And I wonder if this was the photo of the kid's mother. I just keep it with it. But we, so these viewing baskets, they never. They didn't bury children in elaborate caskets. It's just a simple wooden box. But you would rent this from the funeral home, so you can, you know, what you can have a wake for your kid and be in a nice basket. And this, so this was rented out by a funeral home, and we estimate when it was in use, a thousand children probably went to this. Because you got to remember, in the Victorian period, when this was in use, even in the United States, you know, fifty percent of the kids died before they were five years old. And it came with the pillow, the, the barrel shroud, and we just you know, it's all together. And the lining's intact. The ba the spirit you're seeing may be attached to that photograph maybe, rather than the maybe. But it was hit underneath there, and when I dropped it, it fell out because I I didn't drop it. I almost I mean I mean I didn't want to drop it because this is really brittle and it just shatter. But yeah, so. I think that was a, it's a tad, it, it was in there, it probably was meant as a memento for the mother, and it was probably meant to go in a coffin with the child, but never made it, and who knows, it could have stayed in there. I remember it's snuck in the house when I was 13, 14, 14. It under my bed. The mom found it, and was extremely angry about it. But, <laughs> but so many of us came in contact with this when we were so young. Long, so so young, and the, again, they're popular because you don't need it. You don't have to have any psychic abilities. You don't have to pay somebody to do it, and they're just a really a cheap alternative in a way. I I love doing them in here. Um, a lot of people ask me why do I have this room? One, I need a convenient place to store my Ouija boards. Two, it's kind of cool to say I have my own seance chamber. 
but we do do public seances in here. And uh, you go to seeaghost.com, we usually run a couple a month. And I only allow four people in. I don't like a lot of people because I want to be kind of an intimate little setting in here. And we have done some pretty remarkable things in here, especially when people who come in and never use the Ouija board and they talk to their parent, they talk to their past loved ones and stuff. There's no way that could ever be fake. And I don't use the Ouija board with them. I'm here in case things go sideways. <laughs> but, you know, there I've had people come out here crying because their loved ones and stuff like that. And on May 1st, I'm doing an open house and I'm having a discussion, the history of the Ouija board. And then afterwards, you know, people come in, they're in the open house, people come in here and I'm like, oh, oh. And this is the people, I have people that absolutely fear coming in here. And we do gallery readings here. I had a psychic that comes in there. She's trying to in here with the, she's trying to banish and cross over the this, this spirit of the little boy. That, and I said, hey, stop that shit. I said, you have no right. Oh, try to, don't try to cross him over. If he wants to cross over, you'll cross over on the gnome. I said, well, he's interfering with my, I said, well, you know what? This is his home. You're only visiting for two hours. So, <laughs> but yeah. But we let that little, we let that little boy just roam around the office. And people see him. Mm -hmm. People have come across him and see him. So, and I got a haunted office. So, as St. Louis Paranormal Research Society, yes. their office is in the Haunted Lent Brewery. Yes. Down the street from the Lent Mansion. Right. In a haunted office. Right. This is the thing that we, we call this neighborhood Fortress Limp. We, I, we cornered Limp in St. Louis. But we, do tour, we do do tours in the mansion. We do tours in the brewery. We do a, walk, a really excellent walking tour in the neighborhood. It's five out of five stars with almost 800 ratings. So it's perfect rating. And then um, we do seances in here. I do I have a classroom that I can do lectures in. And um, we just... Just have fun. We do tour. We do tours like the Alton Y and Onondaga Cave and stuff like that. But my favorite events are what the hell in this room. And everything's kind of how'd you get all this stuff? I just find it. You know, like I found Jesus. I found him in the flea market. <laughs> Forty bucks. And I'm walking through the flea market with him. People go, congratulate me for finding Christ. I was like, yeah, forty bucks. <laughs> and they only knew where he was going to end up at. But, um, so, <laughs> you've got uh, walking tours yes. of the Lemp neighborhood. Right. You do tours of the Lemp mansion. Yes. Uh, the Lemp Brewery is part of the walking tour? We're part of the walking tour, and then we have what we call the legacy tour, which is the tour of the mansion and tour of the brewery. It's one tour, two different locations. And then we're going to do, we do lectures here, and the open, actually, we turned our lectures into the open house, which is free, and the people come. I mean, we must have a hundred people in three hours come through here, and you know, just as a, this, I love the open houses because it gives a chance to people to just talk about those. People just want to talk about it, and there's no other outlet other than you know, I mean, where do you go talk about ghosts? You try to talk to other ghost hunters, you know, usually they're trying to explain everything away. With yeah. us, you know, we'll hear your story, and, you know, look at your pictures. You do tours of Onondaga Cave. Yes. The y, the Alton Y. Alton Y, which is extremely. I did. I, there's a video on my Instagram at cigos.com of several places that we've done tours in and haunted. If you're interested in haunted St. Louis history, I make these little one minute, thirty minute, one one minute, thirty second videos, and they're on our, at our Instagram site at cigos and. Um, they talk about the haunting of the Y. They talk about the haunting of the steeple, haunting of the fox. fox. Well, no, I haven't done one from Fox. Either. But you do, I do tours. Do the fox. I do do the Fox and Halloween. Yeah, um, that's a big one. That's, <laughs> the Fox Theater is just the old movie palace. It's you go in, it's just absolutely beautiful. There's no, it's just. I mean, you've done it. You've done tours there, and then only because you invited me in. <laughs> and the cool thing is, we get complete rain. Anywhere we're not escorted, go and we can. I mean, and you get to see parts of the fox that no one has ever seen, you know, parts that are just closed off, 
I didn't know I had a radio station up there until I went up on the eighth floor and on the room I had no radio station. Up there. Wow. And uh, even last night you went into a whole new place oh, that the, you we the have a pie factory. That is yeah, that was kind of a neat one. They invited us, they called us. That's our second time we've been in there. And it's an old building built what, eighteen forty nine was it? Something like that. Yeah. And, so, and it looks like they, they've been making corn cob pipes the same way from 1849 to 2021. The only difference is 2022. The only difference is there's electricity now. And they made the corn cob pipe that um, General MacArthur used was made in Washington, Missouri. <laughs> This is, this is one of his, oh, not his. It's a replica. It's but. a replica. They call it the MacArthur, but yeah. This is the pipe that MacArthur, they made it right there. So, do his specifications. Seeaghost.com. Seaghost.com is our website. Um, tours all over. Tours. If you were interested in visiting our Seaghost.com uh, is our website. we got blogs, we got photos, evidence, stuff like that. Our tours. Social media, Facebook at St. Louis Paranormal Research Society, and on Instagram is C at CA Ghost. So. Well, there you go, guys and ghouls, spooks and spirits. That was Mark Farley with the St. Louis Paranormal Research Society. And uh, I got to go once again, because you know I'm all about paranormal unity. I was meeting up with a ghost hunter out of St. Charles County and actually in St. Charles City, Dr. Michael. And he introduced me to Mark, or Dr. Farley now. And, and he really, he got his doctorate. It's pretty cool. But um, he, I, enter, I met him through the uh, St. Charles ghost guys. We worked together. We got along real well. And now... He has invited me along to places like the Stifle Theater, the Fox Theater. He's invited me to Onondaga Cave several times, but I've just never had an opening in the schedule to do it. The Fox, again, Fox Theater, uh, the brewery, the Lent Brewery. I've been many places with him, including this factory, which I'll be telling you more about later. This place is really interesting. And the owners of the place have agreed to come on the show and talk to us all about it. So we'll get them on the show here in a few weeks and we'll chat about that. But again, the paranormal unity is I got along with these folks to meet him. I get along with him. And that means we are one big happy family. And again, they've been really good to me. All of the whole crew, the whole team. In fact, they just recently uh, took one of my old team members in to St. Louis Paranormal Research. And that was really nice of him. He's a good ghost hunter. He knows what he's doing. And they recognize the talent. So Check this out. I even managed to snag a St. Louis Paranormal Research Society Ouija board t-shirt. It says St. Louis on it. I like that kind of stuff. I buy a lot of shirts when I'm out ghost hunting. But the couple things I do want to discuss before we go, and the first one is the Unex magazine. I, it's kind of hard to show you here because of the reflection on the uh, glossy cover from the computer monitor. This comes out four times a year, runs, I don't know, 15, 16 bucks, somewhere in there if you order it. But you can get it for three or four dollars if you get it online download it onto the computer or download it onto an e-reader, which I use e-readers a lot. Things are always a little bit cheaper that way, and uh, I don't have books stacked everywhere. But check this out. Uh, this is the winter issue. The winter issue had a couple of stories from me, one about the Flatwoods Monster in West Virginia, and one about the Bigfoot Museum, also in West Virginia. There is stories in here from Lee Spiegel, from Margie Kay, and several other folks. A lot of Bigfoot stories in this particular issue. But those stories are written by the best in the paranormal field, be it UFOs, uh, cryptids, Bigfoot, or ghosts. 
And like I said, even I have something in it usually. So you might want to check that out. The second thing we need to discuss is the Unex Networks XCon into the rabbit hole. This is going to be one incredible, amazing ghost conference. And folks, you've got to try it out because you don't have to worry about paying expensive for gas. I mean, uh, when I just went to Missouri, gas was, uh, the most I paid for it was four thirty nine. I saw it at four fifty in some places in Illinois. So you don't have to worry about expensive gas. You don't have to worry about getting a hotel. You don't have to worry about finding a place to eat. You get your tickets over the internet. You get on here on May 13th and 14th. That's the days of the conference. Sit back in your easy chair if you've got a smart TV or sit in front of your monitor and see some of the best in the paranormal field. Again, Whitley Strieber. Whitley Strieber jump-started with his book Communion, this whole abduction phenomenon. The man is just incredible to sit and listen to. He used to guest host for Art Bell on Coast to Coast AM. I would listen, and he really, really knows his stuff. I'm telling you, you need to hear this man. Another one will be Lee Spiegel. Lee Spiegel was like uh, a bigwig in, in, in MUFON, Mutual UFO Network. And this guy knows what he's doing. It's incredible to sit and listen to his stories and, and the things he's researched and the thing he's done. Margie Kay is going to be there. Margie's going to be talking about Valiant Thor. And I am sorry, ladies, this is not Chris Hemsworth. This is a different alien named Thor who came here, okay? But again, intriguing stories of government conspiracy, government hiding from us what's really going on. Really cool stuff when you get down to it. Uh, Debbie Ziegelmeyer, she's head of MUFON for the state of Missouri, and she is a diver for MUFON. And she's going to be talking about underwater UFOs and, and the aliens being underwater bases, having underwater bases in the oceans. It's really incredible what some of these folks do. And I'll be there, of course, on Saturday. I, originally Friday, it's changed. I'll be on Saturday, and I will be discussing my adventures in ghost hunting all over the country and there'll be some photos and video it'll be absolutely incredible and wayne lawrence is going to be there and this dude has done some incredible amazing research he has lectured everywhere I, it, it's going to be awesome because his thing is proof of alien activity in our solar system both on our planet on Mars, on the moon. Uh, it's really wild. There's so many more. I can't even begin to name off all the incredible speakers. $29 a day, May 13th and 14th. And again, May 13th and 14th, $29 a day. No other worries, but sit and learn about some of this incredible stuff going on. So that's it for me right now. And on behalf of myself, the guys here at the Unex Network, and uh, back here, old uh, Peter Bonytail, I want to wish you all to stay spooked. <laughs>